We begin by acknowledging with honor and respect the indigenous nations on whose traditional territories the university now stands and whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. We also acknowledge the elders past and present, including MSU's current Council of the Elders, and humbly ask for their guidance. The Valley of the Flowers has been and remains a place of, of learning for Native American peoples, who for millennia have passed ways of knowing, being, and doing from one generation to the next. While land acknowledgement is not enough, it is an important social justice and decolonial practice that promotes indigenous visibility and a reminder that we are unsettled indigenous land. Please note that the Honors Presents Lecture Series welcomes diverse opinions, beliefs, perspectives, and experiences. We encourage all students and viewers to think critically and process the information presented in the lecture series in an open-minded and holistic manner. The content of this presentation is a reflection of Chinese unique background and expertise. So, um, if you need credit for Honors Presents, please see me afterwards. But in the meantime, Tony, you can go ahead and... Start with whatever you uh, I got nothing. Uh, <laughs> but no, no. So the backup is there are more than 21 of you in this thing. So who needs help sending a text? Because <laughs> May would love to help you. So you might have a phone, even if it's a flip phone. I think you can still text on a flip phone. What's up you with 22? You can totally text on a flip phone, Pastor. Here she goes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, so we're just waiting for, A, those numbers to get up. Maybe will you do a head count? Yes. But I'm pretty sure, and then look at this, it's just, it just kicked off. And then I don't know if I have a remote control, so I'm also gonna test that as soon as the circle stops. Oh, hey, funny story, and, and I, I, I budgeted some time for this. Um, I had this boss once, and she didn't really understand the texting instructions, and so she kept trying to text to a sequence of letters, so she typed in retire to where she was sending the text, and then her answer was 22333. <laughs> I shit you not. So, uh, don't do that, right? 26, I guess that's pretty good. Um, auto save is on, let's see if this works. If it works, you're going to see a title. If it doesn't work, you won't see a title. That's me. Sorry. Thank you for reminding me to turn my phone off. So we still have a spinning wheel. Um, oh, no, we don't have a spinning wheel. Okay, so the first poll question was... Um, should you retire Earth Day? Did somebody not have a chance to text? You did not have a chance to text. <laughs> okay, I have a couple more polls uh, set up. And so let's just see what you guys got and I'll see how much work I have ahead of me. Oh, okay, you, are, you received credit, see ya. Uh, because I would agree with you that we should uh, retire the concept of um, Earth Day. Okay, so first slide, um, my subtitle uh, is going to be how to do net zero math. So really it's how to do math. Um, and then to your credit, Maeve, like she came up with a much better program for you today. And that program like had all these words in it, right? So the words included things like a couple years ago, Dr. Ravel and Dr. Seuss wrote, human beings are now carrying out a large-scale geophysical experiment. How has that experiment worked out? Well, the UN chief just called it, well, it looks like an atlas of human suffering, and it's a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. Um, I forgot about that frame that you asked me about like two months ago. Hey, please, there are plenty of seats right here, like right in front of me, and I promise not to fall on you. And then uh, I was snow deprived as a childhood. As a child, I uh, grew up in Costa Rica, and so I've gotten really excited about snow. I think my first snow was like New Jersey snow, so you can imagine, right? Um, okay, so what we're gonna do in a couple quick steps here um, before I have until 3.30. Perfect um, is, we'll talk about Chad, raise your hand if you know who I'm talking about. Wow, five of you. Jamie, you could get out a little tiny bit more. You should know who this dude Chad is. He gave an amazing keynote on Monday night as part of the sustainability framework cleanup. Uh, anyway, he, he's argued, and I agree with him, that cleanup should be piece by piece. 
Um, you'll see what I mean by that. So then I would argue, well, which pieces should we pick up first? Um, I'm gonna introduce this concept through some of my students of gas food lodging as a frame to think about the world. Um, and then what can you do? Which piece should you pick up first and then second? So Chad is this crazy guy, Chad Trudraki. He was the keynoter on Monday. I love these statistics thinking about, man, that is a lot of pounds of trash. Are you with me? And by the way, he's focused on the Mississippi River because he grew up on the Mississippi River. Um, he's only involved 120,000 volunteers. Uh, he's only educated more than 11,000 students. I'm not quite up to that number yet. And then uh, he's only planted 1.6 million trees. So amazing dude. And he was recognized, right, as the CNN hero of the year, like, I don't know, 2013 or something. And he's got, you know, terrific social media. I think the thing that really grabbed me because I brought my lab assistant to this talk <laughs> was him talking about pulling up on these garbage boats into these back channels of the Mississippi River and his dogs would jump out of the boat because they're like, well, duh, we're right here, right here, right there. <laughs> Sorry. But his dogs would jump out of the boat and I don't know if you were there, you were there, Maeve. Like he talked about his dogs would sink underneath the garbage because of course all this trash is floating above 10 to 12 feet of water. I was like, oh, right, I want to take a little bit better care of my dog. Um, anyway, here we go, and I really do like this quote of his. This is from when he won, you know, Hero of the Year. Uh, the garbage got into the water one piece at a time. Maybe that's the only way it's going to come out. Okay, so I found his talk very inspiring. It's a great frame for today's talk. Right, so let's go a little bit upstream for, from where he's based. He's in like East Moline, Illinois. And then we're gonna go a little bit back in time because of course if we're going back in, in, in uh, if we're going upstream and back in time, who are we talking about? Because I tried to like merge two maps here. So he's based here, that's on the Mississippi River. We are not on the Mississippi River, are you with me? <laughs> right, we're on the Missouri, right? Part of the Missouri River, right? So, there, so this is just retracing like Lewis and Clark's uh, journey, right? And so, it would help me if you would picture like, huh, wonder what the Missouri River looked like in the early 1800s, right? And so this is a steamship coming into Fort Benton. Um, you know, this is all pre-dam, I hope you know. Lots of beaver. And then uh, I'm pretty sure back in Lewis and Clark's time, uh, it wouldn't have seen like a big old pile of garbage right on the side. Are you with me? Like there's not gonna be all of this trash, okay. So the question for you guys is, okay, I love Chad, but how do you fix even piece by piece sort of a pollution problem if your pollution is invisible, right? So does anybody recognize this scene? I'm just curious, checking on you guys and your savviness, right? So it's just a, I froze a frame. It's a really great movie. If I had a little tiny bit more time, I would play you a clip, but I'm not going to. Um, Anyway, this is a, a view, overhead view, of when some engineers at NASA were told, okay, we've got to build a filter because there's a slight issue on Apollo 13, which is that due to a certain malfunction uh, that happened on board that ship, um, they needed to start scrubbing CO2 out of their lunar module, right? And so it turns out, like it's a great, it's a really great clip, but I don't have time to show it. And, and this one, I mean, it's got Tom Hanks and all kinds of fancy people in it. But, you know, if your problem's invisible, even 50 years ago, right, we had equipment that could help us measure it. I really tried made, but it didn't work out. I wanted to tell you exactly what the CO2 concentration was in this room. We monitor CO2 in rooms all across campus. Why? Trust me, it has nothing to do with global warming. What do you think? Because it's, it has to do with like performance, like how much oxygen you're getting and how your brain works. Exactly. It turns out, I bet you CO2 in here is 1,500 parts per million, maybe 2,000 parts per million because you all had to huff and puff coming up the stairs and then blame it on the dog because he's huffing and puffing CO2. And it's related, not only does it make you guys sleepy in class, it was not the instructor, right? But it has every, the reason we monitor CO2 in classrooms all across campus, at last count, 250 classrooms are monitored for CO2, is so that you can open up the air handlers and you get more air exchanges, right? The whole idea is trying to grab CO2 down to what it is outside 
across the snow. So I'd argue back in Lewis and Clark's time, I'm gonna do some quick math for you, 280 parts per million. I've been accused of being an aggressive rounder. I embrace that. Uh, that's 280 parts per million CO2. And I bet you outside, right behind Jamie's head, you wanna to wave to everybody? <laughs> yes, she does. Uh, it's 416 or so, but we're going to round that to 420. Why? Because you can jump on Twitter yesterday and Twitter posted, there's this bot, right? That it was uh, 420.66. And trust me, you don't really care about that 0.66. Um, all you care about is about 420. So does everybody get my math here? That you guys, really good job, right? Since Lewis and Clark's time, uh, Industrial Revolution have managed to add 50%. CO2 went from 280 to 420. If you don't buy the 50%, remember I'm an aggressive rounder. <laughs> so I'm going to pause for a second because I'm going a little tiny bit fast, so that's okay. Um, so I'm just curious. You guys are all whippersnappers, um, so pull your phones out, especially those of you who just walked in. Um, so here's the deal. Uh, good. So the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions for an American household is which of the following, right? Is it fuel for your Subaru? You would pick gas. Notice the spelling. <laughs> Who forgot their phone? Okay, then we're gonna see this number like scream up. Hopefully it's active. Uh, anyway, the poll question is, what's the greatest source of greenhouse gas emissions? Is it fuel for your Subaru? Then hit gas, two S's. Is it your food? I just ate, I wolf lunch, that's food with two Ds. Is it lodging, that's just lodge. Uh, and that means the built environment, the snow is spectacular and mesmerizing, I'm totally distracted by it. Or is it other? Okay, we're up to 19, that's pretty good. And when we get to 25, I'm cutting you off. Okay, snoozy loose. <laughs> what, what is taking so long? Like there are two more poles. And if I cut you off, don't let me cut you off. Like, it's just not fun. Let's see if you guys got the right answer. Mm. <laughs> uh, visual settings, like, oh, correctness. Right, so it's really, it's your built environment. Um, and, and part of that is when I, uh, well, you beat me because you had to do all this crazy setup. But when you turn a switch on, you don't really know what is powering your electric, right? Um, you know, I was, I was thinking, oh, by the way, happy Earth Day, right? Uh, so I, I was taking a shower, I'm like, oh my God, you should only take like a three minute shower. And I was racked by guilt. I was like, when you turn on your faucet to shower, like you don't know what's heating your water necessarily, right? I mean, especially in dorms. So bummer that you guys think it's your food, but we're gonna talk a little bit about that. That's good, that's good. Okay, um, and then, whoa. This is the wrong poll. Let's do this poll now, too. This is <laughs> no, 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 no. These are all out of order. It's all good. Watch this. This one? No, no, no. Don't, don't do that one, please. Shoot. Wow. Okay, yeah, they're just out of order. It's fine. We're going to figure this out. Don't do this one. Please don't do this one. It's coming up. It's like how to improve efficiency. Okay, so please answer this poll. Um, and I'm going to be really mean and only give you guys 59 seconds after I tell you what the poll is. So I'm basically testing you to see if you've taken baby soils. Uh, so humans add carbon to our atmosphere every year. If oceans and land add 80 and 120 billion tons of carbon per year, so that's how much the oceans and land exchange with the atmosphere. How much do humans add? Is it one? Then you go ones, is it 10, you go tens, if it's 100, you know, billion tons of carbon per year, or hundo, or a thousand, thousand, right? So I'm just going, let's see if we can get you guys within an order of magnitude. You have uh, 34 seconds. Go. You better get the right answer though. Does everybody understand the question? Right, so I just told you, I gave you a preview, the oceans burp out 80 billion tons of carbon a year. Land burps out 120 billion tons of carbon a year. How much are humans responsible for? And are these guys all honors? Maybe. You guys are all whippersnappers. You should know this. 31. Oh, five seconds. Norge vote. I did. I sent it directly to your phone. <laughs> she knows I'm a huge boomer. And then I will, let's see what you guys got. Uh, Jamie, how'd they do? They crush it? What do you mean? I, 
there's no... I want you to predict. I'm not showing the responses. <laughs> <laughs> no, they did not. They did not, she says. Ooh, yeah, hard no. <laughs> uh, okay, wow. Uh, and then, guys, if you got it right, meaning you guessed right or you actually knew it, you should actually act like you've been there before. Okay, so sorry about screwing up the polls. Uh, let's see, is this what I'm thinking about? Um, let's see if this works. No. Okay, so then this is the carbon cycle, right? So again, the oceans burp out 80 billion tons of carbon a year. I call it sort of a catch and release cycle. It comes back down. The only reason I'm giving you this nice graphic that I did as part of a ranch workshop is that most of you were wrong. Five out of six of you were wrong. You need to have the right answer, right? So land burps out 120 billion tons, but also scrubs. That's called photosynthesis, right? Uh, 120 billion tons. That's also a catch and release cycle. And then um, I always have to update this number all the time, right? So it used to be seven and a half, used to be seven, but it keeps on increasing. But the last number I have, it's about 10. You could argue with me, but well, isn't it supposed to be 11.1? I'm like, look, that's going to round to 10 the way that I gave it to you as order of magnitude. When I normally teach the carbon cycle, and I've done this on an Earth Day before at a different institution, like I'll say, hey, I want to teach you the carbon cycle in six arrows. I'm such a nice guy. I give you credit for two arrows right there, 80 out of the oceans, 80 in. And did you guys know that when CO2 goes into solution, it makes an acid? So that's why the oceans are so bad. I'm okay, just checking. And then uh, 120 out, 120 in. So now we're up to four. Here's the fifth arrow. What's the sixth arrow? Right? It's this big question mark, right? It's, the, it's what are we going to do to pull CO2 out of the air? And I have a very gripping image that I will leave you with near the end of this talk, just so that you remember, and it involves my time with a very small child at the time in a public swimming pool in Tempe, okay? That's important for this era. It's coming up. I know you can't wait. All right, so again, channeling Ta Ch Chad, right, from Monday's keynote, some pieces have a bigger impact. I've already asked you this question. Really, it's lodging. Right? And then you can go find all these crazy uh, you know, sort of infographics, but the really big deal is that our built environment burns a lot of fossil carbon. I don't know if you guys are familiar with coal strip, but it's spelled C-O-L, strip, because they strip mine coal, spelled with an A, right? And uh, that is going offline over the next couple years, right? But that used to power, in fact, the steam plant over by Norm used to be coal fired, right? And now does anybody know what fires, what keeps our buildings warm in the winter? Sorry? Natural gas. Natural gas, good, right? Another fossil fuel. And then just to really cement it for you, right? I just want you to understand that, you know, energy use by industry, energy use in your Subarus, energy use in buildings, like, Guys, it's just really simple energy question. I am not going to talk today about how to decarbonize, right, our energy system. That's not the point of today's talk. I gave that talk last year. It's a pretty good talk. Involved all these big words. Um, and I can share that with you if you find me, okay? Um, and you say something like, Tony, wait, what was this talk about, like, how much copper we're going to need? Um, you'll we're gonna need a lot of copper. And can we mine copper in uh, Montana? Turns out, yeah, there's this huge hole in the ground to remind you of that butte called Berkeley Pit. Okay, so I've been thinking about this, right? Sort of uh, how we power our lives, whether you know it's my Subaru or the kind of food I eat or you know what keeps the lights on for a long time. And we got permission from the honors program to teach um, on-campus seminars related to this gap between science and policy on campus. And then in 2017, they're like, you guys are bored? Yeah, if you wanna go to Bonn, Germany for the Conference of Parties, right? That's a United Nations planning organism. So we brought 11 of you whippersnappers over to Bonn, Germany with us. And then, I don't know if you guys know how this worked, but we're sort of over here in Montana. And then to fly to Germany, you get a free stop over in Iceland. So of course we stopped over in Iceland too and, and had some very beautiful glacier time, which again, I'm not gonna talk about um, for this presentation today. Well, let's just review some basics on gas, and here's where I'll start to um, hopefully educate you guys a little bit, at least on how I frame sort of our footprint on the world, especially because it's Earth Day. Okay, 
Next poll, uh, we're just thinking about that Subaru, and I think I go backwards for the last poll. Yes, okay. So let's say that a politician proposes paying for Americans to switch their vehicles from lower miles per gallon, say five or 20 or 40, uh, to higher miles per gallon, that's 10, 40, 80. Which switch will reduce greenhouse gas emissions the most, okay? So everybody have their phones out? Um, hopefully it's active, it is active. Um, and so what you would wanna vote is fiber, if it's the five to 10, 20 year, that's a two and a zero, my bad. And then 40, 40, ER, and then Trickster, um, which normally everybody who's taking baby soils with me knows that I would say none of the above. But I think we had up to 31 votes before, so let's see where you guys are at. And then I'm gonna check my phone, and I'll tell you guys what Nora voted. She wrote, it's the Rolling Stones. I'm like, what? Or oh, that was a different question. Um, that was a different question. I'm going with Mel Torme again on this question. Uh, I don't know what that means. Mel Torme? Yeah, I'm really out of it. Oh, that's okay. You um, made a boomer joke earlier, so I'm going Oh, to I, you know, I got accused that I'm not actually a boomer, which technically is true, but I'm just like, no, I act like a boomer. Right? So, okay, so we're locking this. Uh, let's see what you guys got. Oh, nicely done. Nicely done. Uh, third most popular answer. Uh, so yes, I am a trickster for sure. Guys, do the math. If you're driving 80 miles a week and you get 40 miles per gallon, that's two gallons of gas. If you drive, if you increase to 80 miles per gallon and you're driving 80 miles, that's a gallon of gas. So big whoop de do, you just shade the gallon of gas. Most wrong answer. Okay? <laughs> Hang on. I know you guys are like, whoa, dude, chill. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. So it turns out in the United States of America, we report the efficiency of vehicles on a non-linear scale, miles per gallon. Anybody know what they report in Europe or Canada or Mexico? Fuel efficiency, vehicles. Liters per 100 kilometers. If I turn all these questions around and I make um gallons per 100 miles, or 80 miles, right? Boom, you guys all get the right answer, and this is not a fun little like uh, thing that you can do. This is your pre-party for your Earth Day party. But remember I said you save one gallon here, and I said that is so wrong? Well, remember if you're driving 80 miles and you get five miles per gallon, how many gallons is that? You guys can do this quick. 16, and if it's 10, eight. Oh my God, that's eight gallons. That's eight X, but you guys went the wrong way. Are you with me? So it's because miles per gallon is a non-linear measure. And then, you know, I'm an academic, right? And it turns out, if you're an academic, you always try to do these gotcha papers. And guess what? It's called the MPG illusion. So these guys got published in Science, right? A hoity-toity journal. And my, my plea to you, right? I'm just trying to teach you a little bit about gasoline. Is that you're gonna, you should learn how to do the math before you graduate and go light the world on fire, for sure. But like, try to learn how to do the math. Are you with me? Okay, that was the last poll question. So you guys can like all be relaxed now. Okay, on food, food's complicated, right? Um, I think pre-COVID, nobody really understood anything about supply chain, but it turns out like most of our farm comes from land. Right, uh, it's not grown in the sea, no matter what you're reading. And then, you know, we have farms and ranches in Montana. Uh, you, you know, some of these animals need supplemental feed. You gotta process the animals. I'll show you some of that processing and how it happens in Montana. And then you need reefer trucks, right, to move your product. And then it's gotta end up at TNC. And then, you know, you gotta go get all your food, which I know you do, um, from the deli counter. What is it, 6 p.m.? They discount all the deli food? I'm, I'm always there, yeah. <laughs> Um, and it turns out, like, I think the food math, you guys voted that this was the biggest source of sort of your carbon footprint. And man, you do not have to go far on the internet to find infographics like this. You should eat less meat and more vegetables because that will lower your carbon footprint. But I'd really encourage you to do the math. Um, so this is what Montana processing looked like last summer. So I got invited up to the Blackfeet Nation for what they call the any days. And uh, there's this huge crowd of people, like from 80 year olds to like four year olds. And I was like, man, this sucks, I can't get a photo. I was like, oh, wait a minute, no one's underneath the truck. So I got underneath the truck that they brought this uh, bison in. So I don't know if you know Blackfeet or Picani, but uh, any stands for bison. Uh, and so that's the, you know, that 
I'm underneath the truck anyway, and I love getting a, a, a front row seat. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit because what are you going to say to the black feet? Are you going to say, you know what? You should really eat less meat, more bananas. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> hard no there. Anyway, um, and the way my brain works, I was in a workshop on Tuesday. It was a regenerative grazing workshop. And I don't know if any of you guys, because again, I feel like I'm 90 years old or 92 years old, but this is like the ingredients for a sloppy joke, right? So it's ground beef. And the important part about this, especially for Montana, raise your hand if you're from Montana. A third, interesting, okay. But it turns out like, I, and I, I hope I'm not like hurting anyone's feelings, but ground beef used to be a cow, right? And so what I like about this picture <laughs> is that, no, some people don't know that, right? So ground beef comes from a cow, and then that dude in the back, like that's Alex Blake, right? He's a rancher right next to Big Timber where this workshop was, and by the way, all he had to do was slaughter one of his cows, right? And it turned out to be the ingredients, you know, for the sloppy joes. And he's talking to another rancher, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Tyrell maybe, um, and his name's Tyrell Hibbard. He actually runs a distillery in Helena, but he's also a rancher. And these guys are trying to figure out what do we do with our cows to be part of the solution, right? And I thought that was appropriate for Earth Day. All right, lodging. Um, does everybody know the difference between geothermal and geothermal? <laughs> I'm sorry, what was your name? Marta. Marta. What's the difference? There's a capital G. Yeah, this is my pet peeve with geothermal. Uh, so I thought I'd, I thought I'd, I'd spend a little bit of time teaching you guys. So if we're lucky, and only if we're lucky, this might work, um, and it might not, which is fine. So I'm gonna do full screen, and I'm just gonna play you a little video. Original music. <laughs> Right, so Marta, I'm glad that you volunteered. Uh, so did we just see a version of geothermal with a capital G or geothermal with a lowercase g? It's a 50-50, super safe. I can tell you I haven't taken baby soils because you're blushing hard. I'm, I apologize. Okay. I don't mean to be mean, but it's okay, a 50-50. Capital, capital. capital G. Yeah. yeah, no, we get that confused all the time. So it turns out capital G, I want you to reserve that for Iceland, uh, places where we can actually generate steam to make electricity. Um, all that you just saw, and those five miles of uh, heat exchange uh, conduit are real, when you're next sitting at rendezvous and looking across the, the field there, like you don't know there's five miles of tubing in there, right? But it's really important. Of course, we've done that for Norm, we've done that for Romney, we've done it for the American Indian Hall. I don't think we did it for Herrick, you know, 1925. Does that make sense, Martha? <laughs> so geothermal lowercase g is just about efficiency. It reduces our heating and cooling loads, which is awesome, because then maybe we don't have to burn as much fossil carbon to, to do that heat and cooling. Geothermal is producing electricity. And you could be like, did you just make that up? I totally made that up, right? But it drives me bonkers when people are thinking, oh, Romney can generate electricity from the ground? I'm like, yeah, no, no. 
Um, okay, so that was that video. I can skip all these. Hopefully you found that instructive. Um, I should point out, you know, the whippersnapper who came up with this video, his name is Sam Atkins, and he's moved on to bigger and better things, and he now runs a company called Foothold in Butte. Right? So what they're doing is they're building prefabricated affordable housing. I haven't talked to him about the energy efficiency, but anyway, he is an amazing guy, Sam Atkins. And then, by the way, uh, so we've been talking about like lots of ways to maybe improve, lower your carbon footprint, but I mean, some of you could still be pretty skeptical, right? Like this is how it started, which is, uh, oh my God, CO2 is increasing, right? And the reason for that is that even though our fossil carbon emissions are small, compared to how much the ocean burps out or how much the land burps out, it's not balanced, right? There's nothing pulling CO2 out of the air. And look at all these conference of parties, United Nations meetings uh, that have happened. And again, we went to the one in 2017, I guess. I mean, the one in Germany, it was sort of the pre-party for the uh, fall. So some people have argued, yeah, not really feeling it. Like maybe we need to do something else. And so that's what I'll spend the rest of the talk talking about, right? So I'll introduce uh, another one of my students, Sabrina. I mean, it's not my student, but she took baby souls with me and we've been trading some ideas. Laura was in a couple climate change classes with me and then Molly and Latrice are two grad students. Um, so I don't know if any of you guys watch this old fashioned way of getting news, which is called TV, but this guy <laughs> is a TV reporter, really good guy. And he had a recent piece, you know, in the last six months. Um, you know, there's this big headache coming to the Gallatin Valley. Um, and I'm not going to play you the clips. I'm just going to show you some things. And one of the issues is that we've got 38 coal trains that are traveling through Bozeman uh, on, on average, right? This is from the Montana Department of Tra Transportation. And that's causing some problems. Uh, and they've done, you know, rail crossing assessments, uh, which ones should be rebuilt. Hope everybody recognizes this is Rouse. Uh, going underneath the interstate, that's where the railroad tracks cross. And then this guy, you know, excellent reporting, you know, he got a person from the Montana Department of Transportation to talk, and, and this guy even started talking about, well, the real elf in the room is, um, they interviewed a local person, yeah, my kids will wake up, you know, they can't sleep through the night, I wake up often, it really kind of worries me, um, and, I'm, and here's where I'm going, having lots of negative effects, so the train does impact everybody. So what Sabrina did, and, and I, I tend to be the kind of human that would encourage this, is she reached out to the reporter, right? His name's Edgar Cedillo, and said, hey, you know, I'm a little bit scared about my future. This is a shot, of, you know, action photo of Sabrina. And I'm kind of worried about changing climate. I loved your train story, but can we talk about the coal it's carrying? And this is his response. Well, thanks for reaching out. I'd love to hear more on some of the ideas you might have about the coal the train carries. And I mean, full disclosure, I, I think this is being recorded, but I'm nervous this is being recorded. Like, what I've asked Sabrina to do is stop a coal train and have a presser with Governor John Forte and Senator Tester and Senator Daines and Rosendale. Like, we get all the big wigs right there. Maybe the mayor of Bozeman. Why are we stopping the trains? Because it's changing your future. It's totally changing your future. Um, there used to be a kid in honors, I think maybe he's graduated by now, his name's Cade, he's the most amazing violinist. And I'm like, dude, you have to do a requiem for Bridger Bowl. You know, for the day when there's no snow left. Guys, 38 coal trains a day through Bozeman. Just stop one of them, like do an event, anyway. Well, she's moved on to bigger, better things, right? She's like, oh, but can you invite all your students to go to March on Northwestern Energy, and that's a week from today. And by the way, do you know Montana's very unusual? In its constitution, it says you have a right to a clean and healthful environment. Anyway, that's a lot of carbon. Any idea how much carbon? Yeah, I'm not supposed to cuss, but like everyone in Baby Soils understands this acronym, B-T-S-O-O-M beats the shit out of me, right? And I read it in all your thought bubbles. And so you should do the math. Um, and that's because Montana State University is doing the math, right? This is Sustainability Week. It, it's no coincidence that, you know, they're doing Sustainability Week, uh, the week of Earth Day. And so they're really interested in like scope one carbon emissions and scope one carbon emissions. That's gas for all of their vehicles. Not a lot of Subarus on campus, but all the buildings, teaching spaces. Normally people think of scope two as upstream activities. People think about downstream activities more as scope three. So let me show you those numbers. Um, remember I'm an aggressive rounder. So don't like have a cow. Like it turns out there's scope one, 
23,000 and change, so we call it 23,000. These are in metric tons, just call them tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, not a big deal. Scope one, right? So that's how much fuel goes into vehicles and how much it costs us to keep heating and cooling all the buildings on campus, 23,000 metric tons. And then there's scope two, remember upstream, 11,000. Downstream, 12,000, adds up 46,000. Okay, you guys are like, yeah, eh, I, don't, I can't really do the math in my head. What is 46,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent? It's a really good question. Well, it turns out one, one, one train, one train is 50,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, okay? You can definitely check my math on that, okay? Um, how many trains are going through? Guys, 38 trains a day but all of MSU for one year. And I haven't confirmed the numbers because you know I asked too late. But anyway, like I just want you to understand that we've got 38 annual MSU emissions rolling through town on their way to where? You guys know? Because tell me, I, I hope you know it's not Oregon and Washington. <laughs> it's going to China, right? To build the stuff that you want to buy, like my phone and my laptop, right? because they need electricity to build the things that we want to buy. Okay, um, anybody know who this character is? So this is a movie called uh, Before the Flood. His name's Leonardo DiCaprio, he's sort of a hot shot. Anyway, uh, no, 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 I'm teaching that climate change class and we actually all went to the Ellen to watch this movie as part of class. Like, how do you like that? You're paying tuition and then we take you to the movies. Um, anyway, he interviews um, a very prominent, um, she's been described as a writer. Anyway, so she was with the Center for Science and Environment. This is Sunita Narain. And if you listen to the clip, which I'm not playing for you, she's like, Leo, whatever she calls him, dude, it's all your fault. You want us to do renewable energy, but what you're forgetting is that 700 million Indians burn biomass, right? That's called, that's code for cow dung, right? Cow pat, manure. Um, it's like, you guys made the problem, you should fix it. And what she asked Leo is, what are you willing to sacrifice? for a more a, a clean and healthful environment, right? That's in our constitution. And so I just sort of changed this a little bit. And I, if I was like him, I would, have been sh I would have been freaked out, you know? But, you know, she wrote, your consumption is really gonna put a hole in the planet. What is the United States willing to sacrifice? And you know what I love about teaching? I have no idea what is gonna stick with a student. But this had a huge impact on one of our students. And her name's Laura Ippolito, and uh, back in 2015, she's like, you know what I think I'm willing to sacrifice? Yellowstone National Park. And you know why I was getting so much grief, Marta? Is because what she wanted to do was geothermal with a capital G in Yellowstone. I don't know if you know about Yellowstone, but it has a lot of geothermal activity, right? And so if you could harness that, you do it where nobody knows that you're doing it, but that would be a great way to power the Northern Rockies. Would you be willing to sacrifice Yellowstone National Park for green energy. If you're uncomfortable with that question, get more comfortable with it, okay? Because that's your future. That is what you are being served up as whippersnappers. So capital G, and I'm sorry I screwed up her LinkedIn, but she now drives an ambulance. Um, so, you know, we're sort of, Trying to wrap up, sort of, I've got a whole bunch of stuff about soils coming up, which is what I'm a little tiny bit passionate about, but Paul Edlin works for our Office of Sustainability and came in and gave a little, you know, stand and deliver uh, talk, and, and he just brought in this one graphic, and, and I really like the way that he frames this up. Um, it's what you can do for the climate, because it's Earth Day, so you're like, you're gonna make a, some kind of big pronouncement, hopefully, today. You know, what brings you joy? Like, you gotta do some self-assessment. What identities do you hold? What are your communities? What needs to be done, and what are you good at, right? And so, the big deal is, uh, what brings me joy is playing with dirt, right? So I'm a soil nerd, that's my training. So, I'm part of what I call the soil interrogation lab, and my identities, well, those are really conflicted, and you guys can cover your ears, because they know me a little bit better than you guys, because they've known me for like 10 years. But like, I have a lot of insecurity, right? Especially around farmers and ranchers, because I'm just the propeller head teacher, right? Um, but you gotta work that out. Like, what are your identities, and what brings you joy? And then this is the worst thing. 
is that, um, <laughs> first of all, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, well, Tony's the university speaker. Dude, I don't even get invited to speak. Yes, I work for the university, but I'm not even this guy like going to the big show. But this is true, right? And, and I love these regenerative ag speakers. They're very good speakers. Um, I don't agree with like all of their math um, uh, or all of their science, but man, do they rile up the crowd. Um, my business also, if you can't tell, is sort of thinking about numbers, right? And I just got this email this morning. Uh, I need you, she's like, Tony, can you write this section? Measurement, quantification, monitoring, reporting, and verification plan. You know, so it's not a very big ask or anything, but this is all related to could soils be part of the solution? But this is my jam, right? I'm trying to sort out could soils be part of the solution? And then um, you guys know how that whole trigger warning thing works, so I'm just going to raise my hand when we get to the trigger warning. It's coming up. Um, so it turns out some people do think that soils could be part of the solution. It's not my idea, right? There's a whole group called Carbon 180. Uh, that's a beautiful set of clods right there, crawling with earthworms. Um, I do agree with this philosophy that it's not just about getting to zero. We gotta pull CO2 out of the air and go negative, right? Um, I love this, leading with soil. Like, those look like happy cows before they got turned into hamburger. Um, and then, you know, I'll talk about a couple of these things. Um, I'll speak first about one of my grad students. She did a really cool compost experiment. And then another one of my uh, grad students looked at um, the effects of managed grazing. Um, so those are coming up. But I want you to understand that there is some scientific literature out there. And if you Google NCS, you know, not, you're not going to get the right thing. You need to Google Natural Climate Solutions. So that's what that acronym refers to, Natural Climate Solutions, NCS. And the big deal is how we manage our land is thought maybe to have this potential to scrub CO2 out of the air. Are you with me? Isn't that awesome? I'm like, okay, yeah, sign me up. I want to be part of the solution. So I've trained some interns. This is Molly's compost experiment. Uh, these are happier days. She was not happy writing her thesis, but she, su she successfully defended in January. This is another one of my grad students, Latrice. She was really interested in, hey, what happens when you bring bison or any back onto land? Like, what does that do for carbon or lower soil respiration rates? And then here's some more math, right? So it turns out that when you're trying to do carbon math, don't buy from anyone who says, oh, will you pay me if I avoid emitting a ton of CO2? Don't do that because there's still going to be one ton of CO2. Remember I told you I was going to give you a swimming pool scene? Okay, so that's coming up, right? It's related to this. We need to really learn how to scrub CO2 out of the air. Does that make sense? So these are two carbon offset schemes, and I have a lot of issues with this one. Like, it's just not part of the solution. I hope you understand that. And then you'll see in the literature a line, I'm, I love my acronyms. This just stands for carbon dioxide removal, but it's basically the same thing. I hope you guys can all figure out that carbon dioxide weighs more than carbon, because a lot of people get that confused. And then I owe a whole bunch of these uh, credit for all of these slides to Jane Zelikova. She runs a group out of Colorado State called the Center for Soil Carbon Solutions, right? So she's really a leader. And I'm going to argue you've got to learn how to do the math, right? Part of the math is everybody get that, man, if you could just make this arrow a little bit bigger, that's exactly what we want. Are you with me? Good. Good. I, I hope that you would like that sort of math slide. It turns out, how do you remove carbon from the air? Well, you can manage your forests. You can sequester it in soil. You could do what's called bioenergy with carbon capture systems. So basically, you burn wood to make electricity, capture the CO2, and then inject that CO2 in the ground. Uh, and then there's direct air capture, and, and you could be like, well, wait, where does the electricity, how do you power the electricity to capture CO2, right? And basically, you have these big fans are just pulling CO2 out of the air. This is, this is what I would buy if I wanted to offset uh, an air flight or my fossil carbon emissions, because this is geothermal powered with Marta's geothermal electricity in Iceland, right? So there's a whole group doing air capture. And then, by the way, what I skipped right here, this is why I was getting asked for help. Um, hey, could you help us figure out how to measure and verify that you're actually storing carbon in the dirt? Yeah, this is a, a, a damning assessment, right? And then it turns out, like, this is, there's too much on this slide, but basically I need you to know that some carbon, when you put it in soil, 
doesn't last there very long. Like I want you to think about one month, that's as long as the carbon might last. And when companies like Microsoft or Stripe, right, are wanting to invest in carbon storage, they want that carbon to stay parked in the ground for a thousand years. Okay, so that's sort of geological uh, carbon storage. <clears throat> Oops. Um, okay, and then it turns out, like this is a great Oxfam report, the only proven way to remove carbon from the atmosphere is to use land to do so by growing billions of trees and storing carbon in trees and soils. And so I just want you to remember this symbol, which I made special for you guys. Um, so that's called a unicorn. Uh, and, and it wasn't my idea, but I mean, I made the symbol. But basically, that uh, unicorn came from this quote, uh, University of Exeter. It's astonishing how the continual absence of any credible carbon removal technology seems to never affect net zero policies. Whatever's thrown at it, net zero carries on without a dent in the fender. For some time, I assumed I was merely ill-informed or overcautious or not doing the math. I've now realized that we have all been subject to a form of gaslighting, whether it's BEX, afforestation, direct air capture, carbon absorbing unicorns. Now you understand this new logo, which should be my lab. The assumption is that net zero will work because it has to work, but beyond fine words and glo glossy brochures, there's nothing there. The emperor has no clothes. You guys are way too young to even recognize that as a Danish fable. Um, so for my students, I've said, look, you got to remember dog food used to be called Alpo, but this is how you need to remember. Anybody that says, I want you to pay me to store carbon, you say, just remember Alpo. Uh, say, well, is it additional carbon? How are you sure that there won't be leakage? In other words, you store carbon here, but how much comes out of the ground over here, right? That's sort of a geographical. And then how long will it stay in the ground? Remember, the number that you should have in your head is, well, maybe my carbon's only going to stay for a month but maybe we want it to stay there for a thousand years, right? Because we want to be part of the solution. That's Alpo. And then you get a zero, right, if you're not doing the math right. Um, and so here's my trigger warning. Um, I didn't come up with that icon right there, but I do think uh, I stole it from Twitter, right? There's a whole book, which I brought for you guys, right, called Calling Bull, because, you know, anyway, it's, it's a hard word to say out loud. <laughs> but anyway, like, um, this is sort of a bummer, right? I want soils to be part of the solution. So I was at this workshop on Tuesday. Uh, this is the regenerative ag speaker. Great speaker, his name's Gabe Brown. I have his book, just bought it. Uh, introduced myself to him. There's lots of interest in regenerative grazing, right? So if you're still around, because you haven't started your, well, I guess this is finals week, but Saturday, May 7th, right? You could go to Big Timber and find the Crazy D Ranch. And man, if you talk to the executive director of Western Sustainability Exchange, her name's Lil, just tell her I sent you. You want to be free passed into that uh, workshop. There's a lot of excitement for regenerative ag. That's great. I wanted to put these natural climate solutions into context for you. Remember I was talking about how there's this lingo, natural climate solutions? Well, just to give you a frame of reference, this line is 0 0.1 billion tons of CO2. Uh, sorry, carbon, right? This line is 0 0.1. Now don't forget, every year we pump out 11 or 10, right? So this is the 1% line. Are you trying to get a feel? Wow, we could do a lot of really great things with our land, but hello, what about the other 99 parts, right? To really be consequential and bring this number not just to zero, right? This is net fossil carbon emissions. We've gotta get it negative. Okay, pool scene. Picture this, it's uh, 120 degrees in Tempe, which is a suburb of Phoenix. And uh, I'm a postdoc, so I have no money, right? And, uh, but man, they're public pools. Tempe has public pools. And this is my kiddo. Uh, he's 17 now and taller than me. Um, has anybody ever, anybody ever been around a public pool? I forget your name. Hannah. Hannah. What happens in public pools? And, and think about a kid maybe a little bit smaller than my kid here. They put the pee in pool. You know, it's worse than that. You do the math, you got 100 kids. They're having so much fun. Cooper's actually faking it really well here. It looks like he's loving diving into my arms, right? And I uh, gotta do the math, right? It's not the pee that you should worry about. It's the poo. It happened to us all the time. Clear the pool, the nets come out, they fish it out, and you 
got to wait 30 minutes, right? Because they're going to chlorine shock it. And then if you show up 31 minutes later, the pool's open. Everyone's just diving right back in because we're desperate, right, for relief. <laughs> Check this out. Great article called Clean Up on Isle Earth. This guy's hilarious. <laughs> There's never been a better time to start a carbon removal company. And I, and I posted this on Twitter. But his, his line that will always endure with me and is really important on Earth Day when you only have one swimming pool. By the way, that is a metaphor for our atmosphere. You gotta fish out the turds already floating around <laughs> while simultaneously convincing people to stop dropping new deuces in the pool. Right, that means you gotta shut the emissions down. And I'm not expecting you guys like march out of here or whatever and go stop a coal train. Like, don't get run over, please don't get run over. <laughs> and by the way, what I advised Sabrina was something like, you talk to Montana Railworks. They're the ones that run the trains. And you say, will you do a press event for me? And they'll be like, why would we stop the train? And I was like, look, I'm no economist. I'm just a teacher. But couldn't you say that doesn't a train company want customers who can pay their bills? Right, because somebody's going to stop, China's going to stop buying Montana coal. Um, it would be nice if that happened sooner than later. And, and I want to recognize, right, this was last year's talk, the economic hardship that that will bring to all the good people of Colster, which strips coal. All right, I really think you should do this math. I think I've shown you examples of how some students at MSU do this math, right? What they're doing is figuring out how they can plug in. So what brings you joy? And for every single one of you, almost every single one of you, you should be able to sort out what brings you joy. And that was only directed at Jamie. That's hilarious. Um, what identities do you hold? And by the way, like there's this whole concept of code switching, right? You put on airs with certain people. You're a little more, more authentic with other people. Like just find whatever makes you comfortable. And Paul had the best way to interpret this. What do you good at? Everybody is good at something. What needs to be done? I mean, I've tried to show you where the low apples are. He's like, you know what? If you just get started on anything, you might actually find a new community, right? Of people that you can hang out with. So I would argue you should do this math every day, not just every day. That's it.